Every year, there's always that small-time indie darling that comes out of nowhere that all the gaming press just swoons over. 2013's indie darling is most definitely the Swapper. Though the game has been in development since 2009, I only found out about it a few months ago when I saw the Steam announcement trailer. As soon as I saw that trailer, I knew that this was a game I had to play at all costs. The visuals were striking, the ambient music drew me in, and the game seemed to promise both an intriguing story as well as an original gameplay mechanic. So, I'll swap into review mode and find out if the swapper has what it takes to live up to both my personal as well as the press's hype. First, some stats. The Swapper is a single-player puzzle platformer game developed and published by the Finnish developer Facepalm Games on May 30th, 2013. It currently costs $15 and is available both on Steam as well as directly from Facepalm through Humble Bundle. It is currently only available for the Windows operating system. This heady sci-fi tale takes place in and around a derelict space station named Theseus, orbiting the planet Cori 5 in the farthest reaches of space. At the start of the game, your nameless character leaves Theseus in an escape pod and crash lands on Cori 5, seemingly unharmed but frightened nonetheless. Your character doesn't necessarily want to be on Cori 5, but you're given no choice but to press on. After exploring a nearby cave, your character comes across the game's namesake device, the Swapper. There are exactly two functions that the Swapper performs. First, it gives you the ability to create clones of yourself. Holding on the right mouse button in an unobstructed area shows the outline where your next clone will be created. Releasing the button creates the clone. You can have up to four clones active at once. Each clone moves exactly as you do using the keyboard keys. They'll all walk in the same direction and jump at the same time as yourself. The only thing the clones can't do is make clones themselves. Only the body of the player directly controlling has the ability to use the swapper. Your main character is highlighted by the light beam from his or her element, so you'll always know where you're at. Clones are absorbed by the main player when they walk into them. The left mouse button fires swapper rays, which allow you to swap your position with another clone if the ray hits one. This is often required to reach different areas of the map. However, just because the swapper gives you these interesting new superpowers doesn't mean that you can use them willy-nilly. The biggest problem you'll run into when using the Swapper are the lights. There are three kinds of lights you'll encounter throughout the game. Blue lights prevent you from creating a new clone in that particular area. However, you can still use the Swapper ray in blue areas. Red lights are the exact opposite, preventing you from using your Swapper ray. It's possible to create clones inside or even beyond red lights, however. Purple lights are the absolute worst. They disable any use of the Swapper inside of them. The majority of puzzles in the Swapper play around with these lights, forcing you to find clever ways around them. Often, this involves standing on switches to shut down lights which prevent you from performing certain actions and getting to certain places. Some puzzles may also contain boxes to push around. In the latter half of the game, you'll also encounter anti-gravity plates. When either you or a clone touches these plates, that body's gravity is instantly shifted from floor to ceiling or ceiling to floor. However, the shift only occurs for the body that stood on the plate, meaning that you'll be dealing with multiple bodies moving around in two directions of gravity at once. This mechanic alone could have had a full game built around it, so the fact that it's only a smaller part of the swapper proves that Facepalm has a ton of creativity when designing the game mechanics. These limitations and environmental features are combined in various ways to create the puzzle challenges that drive the gameplay. Many of the puzzles require you to carefully manage the number of clones that you have available to ensure that you have one a place in the final spot to solve the puzzle. Oftentimes, this will involve killing or absorbing clones to make room in your inventory for a new clone to be placed elsewhere. Some puzzles limit the number of clones further by placing them in wells, just before the puzzle that you can only clone and swap yourself out of. These puzzles are arguably some of the game's most challenging. What's really great about the Swapper is that it's the kind of game that doesn't hold your hand. After the initial opening sections on Cori 5, which serves as a basic tutorial for controls and lights, the game entrusts you with figuring absolutely everything else out. There are no hints. Experimentation, planning, and precision maneuvering are all needed to solve these puzzles. The lack of guidance makes those eureka moments when you finally figure out what to do all the more rewarding. The thrill of solving a seemingly impossible puzzle is what makes games like The Swapper so satisfying to play. 
While most of the puzzles weren't too hard to solve, I did come across a few that had me pondering them for hours, even when I wasn't playing the game. Two puzzles, one around the middle and one near the end, took me quite a while to solve, but I eventually got them once I realized that the solutions were far simpler than I thought they were. The primary collective that you're required to find are orbs. Orbs can be used to access other parts of the space station. You'll need a certain number of orbs to activate consoles, which move obstacles out of your way. All the orbs are guarded by puzzles. The only way to collect these orbs is to have your player control character touch them. You can't simply plop a clone on top of the orb and call it a done deal. But early in the game, the amount of orbs you generally need to solve all the puzzles in a given area to move on. The game does open up more a few hours in, allowing you to visit different parts of the space station to solve puzzles you might have skipped earlier in order to meet the next orb requirements. This can sometimes involve backtracking to find puzzles that you might have missed solving. Luckily, the game's fast system is one of the best I've ever used showing you doors that you haven't been to, as well as objects that you haven't interacted with. In addition, you'll also activate several teleporters found throughout the station, which provide fast travel. This does give the game a bit of a non-linear feeling. However, this is a temporary illusion, as you'll still need to find all the orbs in order to complete the game. However, the order in which they are retrieved will likely be different for each and every player. In between the puzzles are more exploratory sections. I must say that the Theseus is a really fascinating place to explore. It's filled with teleporters, transport beams, switches, lifts, and all sorts of computerized contraptions which create one of the best game worlds I've seen in a while. The environments are constantly changing as you reach different sections of the space station, which keeps things feeling fresh throughout the game. As you get more adept at using the software to move around, these sections only become more fun and enjoyable to play. The only parts of exploring Theseus that I didn't enjoy were the zero-g sections. At some points of the game, the controls shift to a mode where your character floats around in zero gravity. Firing your swapper provides extremely tiny boosts to backwards propulsion. The two problems I had with this were that the propulsion from the swapper was extremely small, meaning that you often had to click a lot to get where you wanted to go. The second is that the camera rotates around your character so crazily that you constantly have to keep adjusting the spots you click so that you can go straight. I absolutely hated these sections of the game, even if they are visually neat because of the controls. At least Space Palm kept these sections brief, and always had a teleporter ready to use on the other side. The game's narrative, like the puzzles, doesn't spoon feed you, which may or may not be a good thing depending on the type of storytelling that you enjoy. The game doesn't necessarily tell you straight up what happened to Theseus. Instead, you'll find memory logs scattered throughout the station which serve as diary entries and journals for the ill-fated crew members. The game offers you the chance to piece together these logs to form your own conclusions, and it doesn't give you straight or easy information. I personally find stories like this to be a bit distracting, though I understand that some viewers like a challenging narrative, and that's what you're looking for that the swapper is your game. Plus, the game's MacGuffin, Intelligent Space, is quite silly and the game has trouble getting past the awkwardness of this. The storyline is at least represented, however, with terrific voice acting and amazing space cinematography. The ending is actually one of the more interesting I've come across recently, and will almost certainly have some players looking at the events which transpire throughout the game in a different light. In fact, the storyline really begins to make any kind of sense during the game's final moments, and I wouldn't be surprised if someone replayed the game again to fully understand the story. The Swapper is definitely one of the most atmospheric games out there. Blinking lights, echoing footsteps, sparking wires, CRT monitor effects, and multi-layered parallax scrolling all immerse you in the abandoned sci-fi world of the Swapper. What's so surprising then is that the Swapper's visuals are made out of clay and found materials. While the style is, at least on paper, evocative of the claymation films of Nick Park and Henry Selleck, as well as other games such as Platypus, the Swapper differentiates itself from what's that's become horror by having a more realistic look to the art. Do you notice initially the claymation effect on some things such as the escape pod at the start of the game? It doesn't take long before the visuals start to seem almost real, like a computer monitor suddenly became the window to an alternate universe. Because the visuals are not monitored through a computer, it gives them that tangible feeling that really enhances the game's illusion. Similarly, the music and sound effects are all very ambient and appropriate for sci-fi, and the final piece in the swapper is virtually flawless presentation. Overall, while the story didn't necessarily deliver for me personally, I can still say that the Swapper is a title that lives up to the hype. 
It delivers a novel gameplay system and challenging puzzles wrapped up in a beautifully presented and sometimes magical world. It's one of the best games of the year so far.